Marvelous! I remember there was this game I used to play released way back in 2007. It was one of those games a kid like me at the time shouldn't have been able to get my hands on. It was a hyper-violent hack and slash. I don't remember any of my friends having it, but there was something so eye-catching and raw about it that you couldn't help but want to see all it had to offer. It wasn't a game that should have been on the console release. It was violent and dark, but in it was a story about nobodies that took a path of violence and despair as we the player were granted a chance to meet them, and in some way give them the spotlight they were never able to get, understanding their sorrows, their flaws, and why they fight. It was so cool. You played as a broke otaku living off the last few scraps of cash he had left in a place called Santa Destroy. He ends up getting persuaded by a mysterious lady to kill off high-ranking assassins. Armed with a beam katana won from an internet auction, he sets off to become a ranked assassin himself. Each person you killed would get you higher and higher in the rankings, until eventually there was no one left, and he had finally reached the top. Everyone would know his name to be Travis Touchdown, and that game was known as No More Heroes. It was a ridiculously engaging story, with lots of blood, violence, and crazy twists. It was something worth remembering, and it even ended up getting a follow-up sequel. It was pretty mixed with the fans, and though not as strong as the original, it still had some interesting topics to cover like dealing with fame and having other strangers behave almost parasocially around you, being inspired enough to pursue the same twisted career you chose to do. And the music was absolutely bitchin'. Eventually, that was it for the series. And for years, that would be all we'd get in the franchise. Until years later, we got a trailer for Travis Strikes Again in 2017 a sequel that came out in 2019 that was more of a catch-up and an introspective look at our lovable otaku and the return of the series creator, Suda51, in the director's chair. It was great to finally be able to revisit this world and catch up with Travis all these years. And it wasn't the end either. A proper numbered follow-up as well as remastered versions of 1 and 2 were announced so everyone could have the chance to try and catch up to the series. And here I am now, finally getting my hands on it. Where do I begin? So, I guess this is where we'll be talking about spoilers, huh? Yeah, enough time has passed. Yeah, it has been a couple of weeks. So, this is your final warning. No More Heroes 3 sees the return of Travis Touchdown and the whole gang. But this time the stakes are higher than they've ever been, as an all-powerful alien prince named Fu has decided he wants to challenge planet Earth, but to keep things the least bit fair, he does it officially through the UAA, directly causing Travis to act, because this time around, things are different for Travis. He's no longer alone, but has since then created what basically is a family. So he has people he cares about and needs to protect. Hell, he's even a father of two now. And with this alien crew deciding to mess with his hometown of Sand to Destroy, Travis has to act. It's honestly such a great setup, like uh, where does one go from being the top assassin in the planet? Just bring out intergalactic forces to challenge our main characters. As always, Travis is thrust right into the action, this time fighting alien foes and this time around, the gameplay feels so fluid. With previous entries, the gameplay always felt like it sat more in the background, while the style, story, and presentation are what really elevated the game. Now it feels like all systems are firing at all cylinders, which adds a whole new level of nuanced approach to this game and its combat. It makes you want to fight more while also engaging you on clearing out situations because the threat all have their own counter strategies that make you use every tool in your arsenal to fight back. Stances are gone, but in its place we have improved combos and the jump from TSA, which I'm always rudely reminded of in certain fights. Instead of fighting armies of dudes in suits, we now have several different enemy types, each with their own movesets and patterns. Like, there's so many different monsters, and they're one of my favorite parts of this game because not only are the big bad guys a threat to Travis, these sort of ground soldier units are also a challenge of their own. The Death Glove makes a return from Travis Strikes again, and that makes No More Heroes 3 feel more character action than it's ever been. 
And with how much you fight in this game, it's nice to know that it never really feels like it overstays its welcome, because it really is that much fun. And that's thanks to Toru Hironaka, one of the head programmers at Grasshopper that's been there since the first No More Heroes. According to Suda, Hironaka just kept getting better and better with each entry, and I can't help but agree because it shows. Man, this feels so snappy and fun. The only thing I'd say it's missing is being able to dodge cancel attacks, but other than that, it's fun every time you pick it back up. There is some stuff I want to get out of the way before I talk more about the game's story and characters, as there are some very apparent sacrifices that were made to make this thing happen on Switch. This game is honestly really, really rough on the eyes, which is so sad to see because I really love this game, but I can't defend this. And it sucks to see it held back due to the platform it's on. And to add to some of that disappointment, a recent interview dropped with Suda discussing the game's development. He talked a lot about the budget and time and how many ideas were planned that never really got to see the light of day, which is a bit sad to hear, seeing parts of the game that were complete only to then be removed in the final product. Now, I don't think this had an impact on my enjoyment of the game itself, as I feel No More Heroes 3 delivered a very satisfying entry. I just hope one day we get a version with some of the cut content placed back in to get a more realized version of what might have been. <laughs> PC release, please. Getting back to the game itself, Grasshopper manufacturers seem to change the kind of design philosophy with No More Heroes 3. Instead of having levels like we're traditionally used to from the older entries, everything has been changed to these instant-based fighting arenas where you fight in a sizable space, usually in a spaceship, a store, landscape, something small like that. And it's so whenever you're fighting enemies, the game can perform at the absolute best it can given the console it's on. And when you're fighting enemies, the game does keep up at a high frame rate, which is something to commend all the devs involved because, well, let's be honest, the more years that pass, the more and more the Switch really starts to need a follow-up. Although I do miss going through those structured stages from previous titles, we at least got the open world back as Santa Destroy was just as much as a vital character to No More Heroes as the rest of the cast are. And not only do we get to explore Travis's hometown, but we get a bunch of other districts to ride over to as well each very distinct from one another, providing a myriad of different collectibles like scorpions, t-shirt aliens, kitties, and a whole bunch more. There's this little sweet nod to Legend of Zelda whenever you open and close your map, and it's really nice to kind of see the Sudiverse being expanded on more. I pretty much liked all the districts except Call of Battle. Th that place hurts. The music is cool, but navigating it is a chore, let me tell you, and the mud filter it just makes it even more of a headache. I personally come to love Perfect World because of just how tranquil it feels. I remember my first time going there and just kind of driving through the streets, just vibing as the Garden of Insanity just towers the city and I get these like super dead dead demon vibes from it. And when you get off your bike, you're treated to this piano track that is so genuinely beautiful. As you explore these sections, you must undergo qualification rounds and gather enough scrap before you're able to take on an assassin. And as you pass through these districts, we get to quickly see the fatal effects whose invasion has caused the landscape to change. With Santa Destroy City being obliterated by just one beam, leaving a massive hole in the middle of the town with probably dozens of innocent civilians wiped without a single trace. It's pretty fucked. As the world tries to react to a sudden invasion, the President of the United States is killed instantly with Fu and Co quickly oppressing the planet with almost no struggle at all. Even our most destructive weapons of war are completely rendered null. So I guess we can talk about the antagonists of this game now. We have Fu and nine other space criminals that Travis must fight and kill in order to prevent the planet from being enslaved and destroyed. Honestly really, really love the aliens here. They all have impeccable design, and each with their very own unique personalities and boss fights. And what makes them very interesting is that they're not here because they want to invade Earth just because, but rather they're here because Fu either destroyed their own planets, or forced them to become his underling in exchange for not wiping out their species. And while their motives aren't always specifically highlighted in the fight, 
it is at least acknowledged and it made me like them way more than I would have if they were just evil invaders. But this isn't something that's new to the franchise. The people Travis kills in all the previous games have their own reasons, motivations, and stakes, and it's great to see that also stands true here, even in a galactic scale. We also have a couple of human antagonists, one of them being Damon, the kid who helped Fu return to his home planet. All these years later, Damon has become a major figurehead due to the power given to him by Fu when he was younger. He uses this ability to become essentially a powerful CEO. And I think he's behind gentrifying most of the city and creating the districts we go to as Utopia Land and Damon Tower are completely towering everything. Like you're reminded of this everywhere you go. And it's all these little details that all come together and help me appreciate the story all that much more while also highlighting that even with how evil and destructive Fu is, Damon manages to feel like a much bigger threat due to how calculated he is behind the scenes as he begins to act on his own in a plot to get rid of Travis himself. Now before I get to Fu, because I, I have some words about him, I want to talk about how fun these boss fights ended up being. We get loads of themed boss stages, each with their own gimmick, and they've always been sort of the second main attraction of these games, as you're brutally slicing each other up while the boss design is telling the story of that opponent for you. And No More Heroes delivers some of the absolute best boss fights in the series. Some of the highlights for Gold Joe, a criminal space rock smuggler that you fight in a giant wrestling ring where you have to use magnets to push one another to electric ropes. And not to mention Joe himself is just such a joy to be around as his personality shines even through the fight. Damn! Snap, crackle, and got damn! Velvet Chair Girl has this beautiful animated segment that leads you into playing an actual game of musical chairs while you juggle the correct buttons on a metronome to make sure you don't trip while one of the best songs in the game is playing. We have a turn-based boss fight with Sonic Juice as well as the return of Kimmy from No More Heroes 2 as she invites Travis to a concert and they have a straight up rap battle that leads into a bloody death duel. But the star of the show for me has to be Midori's stage, as you're thrusted into a Japanese abandoned school where you must navigate in first person these eerie empty hallways. Following this mysterious light and checking door to door as blood begins seeping through the cracks of everything. These default looking Unreal Engine models adding an extra layer of uneasiness as they mimic the students that were once there. It was such a genuine treat that only got better as you reach Midori and fight her and her daughters in your fully decked out mech suit. It's just such a great boss level and one that's going to stick with me for a great while. If there's one common theme in this game is that there's a lot of stolen kills. Most of the alien roster you don't end up getting to fight as they're easily thwarted by other powerful humans or food just having a bad day. And I can see that being disappointing to some people, though for me, it just never stopped being funny. There's just something so entertaining about seeing these powerful people caught off guard so easily. <laughs> so now I think it's time we talk about Fu. I am very conflicted with Prince Fu because I think he's a great and powerful foe and almost a complete antithesis of Travis's growth, as Fu is completely in it for the fun and bloodlust like Travis used to be, where the Travis of now constantly struggles coming to terms with killing people he doesn't want to. Fu doesn't even bat an eye as no one is equal to him, nor does he care about others, and I think it's the perfect antagonist for Travis to fight. But what I really don't like is that in the beginning, we're given this characterization that Fu does at least care about his companions, at least respecting them to some sort of basic level. Earlier in the game, he confronts Travis because he killed his friend Mr. Black Hole, and Fu wants an eye for an eye, which results in the sad death of Badman and Shinobu losing both her arms, as our heroes are completely overpowered by Fu and can do nothing to prevent it. Just for Bad Girl to come witness the aftermath of it all and shut down in front of her father's corpse. So we get this sort of introduction about the kind of alien Fu is, and before each fight this gets even more built upon as he has a heart to heart with his companions, and we start to see this development start to occur in his character. And some of the conversations he has with his recruits are honestly genuine. But then all that just gets abandoned in the end with no real justification. You fucking dick prince! 
he just kind of ditches it all just because and sort of just gives in to his bloodlust, which honestly really weakened his character in my head as I kind of felt like he was no different than any other common boss we fought before. He was starting to become an almost likable leader, starting to learn how important the bonds and relationships can be instead of the endless and pointless pursuit of ultimate power. His boss fights didn't do him any favors either as it was just a slog in the first wave. And the second phase is just kind of a revisit of Mr. Black Hole's gimmick of him shooting his arms through the portals, except it's for a whole boss fight. It was really disappointing honestly, but luckily enough for us, he in fact was not the final boss as Damon becomes the final threat. And oh man, that boss fight is so fucking cool. It's a massive scale mech fight that just leads into this straight up Smash Bros parody where you and Damon are fighting on this island and you have to blast them off stage. That kind of explosive ending just kind of sums up what No More Heroes 3 is to me. A bombastic and grand return not only for the series but for the director Suda himself. It's a beautiful display of one of the most creative and authentic game devs out there. And there's so many things to like about this game. I love that Gene now talks. I love that Bishop returns and is finally a character now and that him and Travis have a podcast where they fan over their favorite movie director. I love that we get connections to the rest of the Kill the Past series even if it's just a simple nod. I love the callback to the first No More Heroes where you and Henry fight outside the motel. And now he seems to be the focus of what could be the future of the series with maybe even new characters to play as in the horizon. And the music is fucking soundtrack of the year. I don't know if I can play it on this video, but trust me, it is. It just all comes together in this kind of chaotic, passionate package. And it's just one of those experiences that kind of remind you why you love video games in the first place. I love No More Heroes, and I sincerely think Suda is a huge inspiration to me and plenty of other people to kind of be the most authentic version of yourself you can be. Something that's thoroughly present in his games. A couple of years ago, way before the pandemic hit the world, the last convention I went to was MobileCon 2019. I was super burned out at the time and went to that convention with such negative emotions the first day because of how my job at the time was really bumming me out. But I was surrounded by good friends, so those thoughts started to disappear and I was able to have a good time. It was also my birthday weekend, so I couldn't just be a mope about it. It was a real treat to see Suda51 would be returning to host a panel where he would announce that Travis Strikes Again was coming to Steam to a very, very pleased crowd. Yeah! At the time, I didn't really realize just how much of an impact Suda and Grasshopper was to me, as I only really played a handful of his work like No More Heroes and Killer is Dead. It's only been up until recently that I tried to dive into some of his earlier work where you really get to see what got him and his team up to this point. All of his games being vehicles for points of his life and the kind of things he thought were important enough to want to talk about. He always has something to say, something to show, and something that leaves you always thinking, no matter how weird or bizarre or strange it might be. It leaves you with something to digest and analyze. And I think it's great that he's able to show us those thoughts in such an artistic and human way. I'm really glad I got to play his games, and in some way grow alongside them. And No More Heroes 3 is that sort of game that shouldn't even exist, but it does, and it shows that Grasshopper isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, leave a like and a comment. And if you'd like to support us further, be sure to give our Patreon a look as you can support us with just $1 a month. I appreciate you and I'll see y'all soon.